Indian Railways carrying 23 million passengers or FedEx handling 29 million pound of freight per day or the famous Arvind Eye Care Hospital performing 1500 surgeries daily. All entities owe their success to the highly effective and synchronized operating model attributing operations excellence. Be it humanitarian supply chain, military operations, natural disaster management, or workings of global businesses, operations excellence is a strategic weapon to many. Symbiosis Institute of Operations Management, NASIC, a forerunner in anticipating the criticality that the field of operations beholds, is India's only institute fully dedicated to operations excellence. Under the gamut of Symbiosis International University, SIOM is a sui generis institution established with the mission of empowering and leading operations excellence. True to its mission, SIOM has been fueling the industry with operations professionals churned out of its flagship MBA program in operations management exclusively for engineers since its inception in 2005. Owing to its contributions to the field of operations, SIOM has grown beyond laurels of the best industry-related curriculum and it is all geared up towards Industry 5.0 with inclusion of machine learning, artificial intelligence and IIoT. Providing an excellent industry interface, SIOM now an operational excellence hub attracts top recruiters for operations related profiles. SIOM boasts of its alumni presence and recruiters network in top companies across the sectors be it manufacturing, logistics, retail, e-commerce, hospitality, banking and financial services, consultancy, pharmaceutical and many more. Surmounting credibility by corporate recruiters is an outcome of holistic and multidisciplinary engagement of students, be it technical expertise, leadership values or social sensibility initiatives strategically woven in overall learning environment. Backed with robust project-based learning, Harvard simulations, case studies, research orientation and strategic industry interface through research conference, guest lectures, HR summit, operations summit, Tattva, TEDx and two internships. The students are all geared up to take on the challenges of rapidly evolving technological capabilities and value chain complexities, the critical areas of concern for every organization today. SIOM, with intent of knowledge dissemination, offers corporate training programs, customized certifications, and consultancy services in the area of operations. We value and appreciate our long association with the industry at large. Connect to us for anything and everything related to operations. SIOM pulsates with the conviction that future CEOs and industry leadership will emerge from operations and supply chain domain and we feel responsible towards it. The Citadel of Learning and Competency Development is exclusively for working executives, MBA aspirants, and the corporates. We act as catalysts to fuel their careers and of course develop operations competencies within organizations. This love for our niche has developed key result areas which will impact your triple bottom lines very, very positively. A perfect symbiosis of industry and academia SIOM is one-stop shop for everyone who is excited about operations management. I invite you to SIOM, not just to fuel your talent supply chain, but also to engage with us on your operations expertise and experiences. Come, let's engage. Connect to the best in operations. Engage with SIOM for operations excellence.
set by the business leader of the Adani. Business is all about risk taking and managing uncertainties and turbulence. Good evening to one and all. We, on behalf of the Simpsons family, take immense pride in welcoming you all to the penultimate episode, the eighth episode of 12th edition of our annual flagship conclave, Digital Edna Summit 2020. As this year is testing the world with so many challenges, one thing is for sure, the show must go on. Hence, presenting you Digital HR Summit 2020, where we believe in taking the most of the time and opportunities. I, Shikha Singh, will be your host for the event today. In turbulent times, making a decision can be daunting. If you act too slowly, the business might go under. A bold bluff too soon, and you might lose the queen. As the situation nears normalcy, business leaders will all to strategize and keep the engine running. With this, we would like to introduce our theme for the event, the unprecedented roots, continuity amidst chaos. HR Summit 2020 would not have been possible without the general support of sponsors. We would like to thank our sponsors, our outreach partner, Dare to Compete, our magazine partner, Human Capital, our home decor partner, the Moharaj, our official gifting partner, the Soul Store, our digital platform partner, Airmeet, our knowledge partner, Noah, Novarex, our event listing partner, Noah Fest, our corporate gifting partner, The Good Road. Let me now introduce to you Dr. Vanna Sonwane, who is the founding member of Symbiosis Institute of Operations Management and has been the director of the college since 2008. Dr. Vanna Sonwane has a versatile experience of over 27 years in various multinational brands in FMCG and service sectors with profiles in logistics, service enhancements, brand liquidation, sales and operations, supply chain management, and consultancy. Under her able leadership, SIOM received the Pride of Maharashtra Award by Industrial and Economic Development Association and SME Chamber of India, supported by Government of Maharashtra. She is also a recipient of the Indian Leadership Award for Education We'll just wait for a few seconds till and check if Shika comes back. Sorry for the network issues. I'll continue with here. Let me now introduce to you Dr. Vandana Sonwani, who is founding member of Symbiosis Institute of Operations Management and has been the director of the college since 2008. Dr. Vandana Sonwane has a versatile experience of over 27 years in various multinational brands in FMCG and service sectors with profiles in logistic service enhancement, brand liquidation, sales and operations supply chain management, and consultancy. Under her able leadership, SIOM received the Pride of Maharashtra Award by Industrial and Economic Development Association and SME Chamber of India, supported by Government of Maharashtra. She is also a recipient of India Leadership Award for Education Excellence by All India Achievers Foundation. She is currently on board of management at Symbiosis International University. She has been a member of Academic Council at Symbiosis International. She is a member of CII Maharashtra and Steering Council of the India Network Women Network Maharashtra Chapter. She was conferred with the Outstanding B School Director Award by Association of India Management Scholars International at the 17th AIMS International Conference hosted by IIM Kohikod on Jan 2020. Let me now invite Dr. Vandana Sonwane to share a few words. 
thank you sachi thank you uh, very good evening to all of you good evening to esteemed speakers uh, uh, good morning uh, mr datta our speaker for uh, this keynote session uh, a very good evening to delegates academicians and of course uh, my dear students welcome to the fifth week of the hr summit 2020 uh, today in india we are celebrating teachers day and i take this opportunity to wish all the teachers a very very happy teachers day uh, congratulations and kudos to your invincible spirit of uh, standing tall to the call of duty in such such disturbed and turbulent times believe me the uh, we are everyone is talking about the corporate world and the turbulations in the corporate world uh teachers and academicians uh, let's talk of the turbulence that's happening in the education sector also but it's very challenging and hence very enjoyable so thanks to everyone and uh, wish you a very happy teachers day again uh, at hr summit uh, this week uh, weekend we unveil uh, another set of powerful conversations uh, on topics that really matter to all of us yeah uh, the why the what the how and the who of this crisis that is pestering us so much you know and that we have landed ourselves into i dare to say that the crisis that we have landed ourselves into because yes uh, i think we the reason goes back to us also yeah uh, this summit is siom's very very small india board to really understand how organizations strive for continuity amidst chaos Uh, what's working and what's not working you know that, that that's the uh, qu query we would always have uh, with immense pleasure and gratitude on behalf of everyone at siom i welcome the brilliant seeking minds that are with us today on a saturday evening you know to our flagship annual conclave that's hr summit uh, the pandemic hasn't changed our urge to really learn and relearn and i believe uh, this completely resembles with the theme of the hr summit that we are discussing uh, this year for the past 4 weeks uh, during this pandemic uh, or during this demanding time uh, ensuring uh, balance of supply and uh, demand of human capital in any organization is challenged yeah there, there is a need uh, for a lot of customization realignment of the current hr practices uh, so so that we are in tune with the current situation uh who else would actually do the best honors uh, to the topic than our keynote speaker mr suraju datta uh, who is the joint managing director at delivery and uh, he is joining us uh, from london uh, thank you mr datta for being with us today in the second session uh, we speak of the authentic workplace culture as a sustainable and uh, advantage uh, an authentic workplace nurtures people's uniqueness and individuality yeah mr hari uh, tn will uh, with his huge experience across startups and many other organizations will share his thought with us on this topic so i'm looking forward to a very insightful enlightening session and i i hope the same with you also enjoy this uh, great saturday evening full of learning thank you so much for joining and have a great evening thank you over to you sachi Thank you, ma'am. Wonderful words. Let us now proceed to the next session.
Now I'm going to try and get back to the screen. So here we go. All right, I'm back. So going back to how do you adapt or how do you lead the changes during COVID times? Let me put it this way. Everybody's talking about the COVID times and uh, what the massive disruption it's done to global, uh, the global economies around the world. And there is all this new changes that we need to work with. Uh, just get yourself about 20,000 feet up from this problem. This is a blimp in the history of global commerce. Just like there was the plague in the middle, in the, in the, in the, in the middle, middle, medieval ages, there were uh, SARS a couple of years back, and so is COVID. And it will move on. And by next year, you will get your vaccines. And by the third year, everybody would have practically forgotten that this thing ever happened. So if you're going to make changes to the way you operate, you need to first think 10 years down the road. Don't think just for now. For now, it is masks, social distancing, and all that stuff. But really, for major changes that you want to bring in to your organization in the way you operate, and the way HR will drive those things, there's no difference. HR for us is a part of the organization. It's not a separate standalone unit. It's actually part of how you do business. So anybody that you're trying to hire into the company, you're trying to motivate, there's really no change. It's just the way that you're communicating right now. But if you look at this event as just a one or two year event, and then everything is going to switch back to more or less the normal in terms of the trade and the complexities of business and everything else will remain the same. So your HR practices, I want to take this opportunity to say that they are not practices. They're a way of life for every individual in the company. So if you can get, as an HR professional, if you can get your thoughts, beliefs, and how you operate as a way of life with every individual in the company, you're down. There, there's no uh, you know, secret ingredient to all this. Uh, I'm not going to you know, spend hours talking to you about motivational speeches and how to get your people to go above and beyond and how to choose the right person by doing psychometric tests, all that stuff. Yeah, all that stuff is well and good. But the key point I'm trying to make is that every individual that you are bringing into the company has got to share the passion, the vision, the sense of collaboration, and the responsibilities that you want every single individual to have. Once they have that, your HR team can drop to like five people. You don't need an army because to do administration, to do all the running of a company, it's done by operations. In I'm talking about logistics or you know service industry, where 90% is frontline and the 10, 15% is the back office supervisory roles. So these frontline people, if they are adapting to what HR is supposed to do in terms of uh, you know, attendance, in terms of performance uh, cycles and, and leave management and all that stuff is done by the people. Every person is a unit with a team. So that unit and that team should be treated as people running a business. So all of us become entrepreneurs. It is my company. So the moment we start to think it is my company, you start to operate it like your own enterprise. And every team leader has five employees. And there are 100 team leaders, which means 500 employees or you know, 250 employees. Those units become your HR house. So that's the difference that I'm talking about. And in terms of how, do we, how does HR adapt or or lead changes in times of crisis is not just HR. Let me put it this way. 
a company that has to be successful through crisis looks at its leadership to point the direction. It is exactly like the military, exactly like the Navy or any other large organizations with a large number of people following it. It's the leadership at the top, the four or five people between the CEO, CFO, COO, and all the C positions that really need to put on or, or take on the role of serious leadership in times of crisis and say, okay, my business has gone down by 90%. How do I look after the 50,000 people that depend on me? And if your thinking is, let me cut down the workforce by 40% so that the rest we can save and continue until we get past this, you're probably going down a slippery slope. If you don't think that way and you think, how do I expand my business? How do I turn on a dime? If I'm selling lemonade today, how do I make idli? instead of lemonade, because that's going to sell today. Now, that's a very simplistic example I'm giving you, but that is the reality. When I've seen what happened at, at delivery, when I see what is happening at the successful logistics companies that are turning around or have turned around during this time, is they diversified almost on an instant. We started selling different products, used different technology to do it, and the entire workforce rallied behind this change. So nobody got nervous, nobody got, oh my God, now we're all gonna die, nothing like that. It was extremely confident, extremely driven, said we are going to now start selling pharmaceutical companies, their logistic solutions rather than e-commerce companies. We're gonna start selling you know, uh, food outlet services rather than delivering Amazon packages or B2B. We're gonna start aggressively looking at moving trucking rather than individual express courier movements. And that change and the speed of that change in how you adapt is what will make or break your company. Where HR comes in in all this is the kind of people you will have to hire even during, through, during these times and through these times will be radically different than what you're used to hiring. And the kind of people that you'll have to nurture to help grow this new strange business that just came in over your horizon will have to be different. So even you as a HR leader or an HR professional will have to rethink what kind of people that we have never even met before, now we will have to interact with them and see what motivates these folks and get them on board. So it is the entire company, not just an HR piece, that needs to lead this change. You need to think ahead of the curve. If you're thinking, I'm going to adapt to that change, you're probably already too late. So here's my, uh, my, my little core message for you, is look at your environment and decide not to follow, but decide to grab that change and make the changes within your company so that you become familiar with it and you kind of lead the way. So if you can actually lead the way, you will. or any kind of comments or anything that I can I can respond to or, or clarify for you. Thank you very much. Thank you for such an insightful session. My, take, my key takeaway was right attitude for teaching, coaching, and learning must be in the team and will always lead to success. We shall now move on to the Q&A session I request the delegates to please post their questions in the question tab while I take few questions from the question tab. So, uh, Ms. Navneet Kaur is asking, how important is the realignment of the recruitment strategy with the current organization's goal? 
extremely important uh, when we are saying realignment it's almost like you're saying okay as an after thought but the moment a crisis happens uh, the the uh, connection between the business units of the company and the talent acquisition teams within the company has to be almost instantaneous and that discussion or that dialogue between the two is not a once a week event it's a daily event of discussions on what is required by the sales team to sell refrigerators when they were selling mangoes and what kind of people we need to get so that we don't get mango sellers trying to sell refrigerators that is a daily conversation that needs to happen it's not a once a week event okay so we have one more question mr joel john is asking what according to you is the one skill or character trait that you will never compromise on while recruiting a candidate integrity thank you sir in the interest of the time we will now have one last question excuse me sir mr sagar sadaya is asking what role has innovation and automation played in the realignment of hr operations in the times of supply chain disruption i would like to say a huge uh, influence but let me put it this way the role of innovation and automation is not just during the times of crisis it is an extremely extremely critical part it's like having the carburetor of your car missing so it's an extremely important component of running a company at any point in time a successful fast growth company and particularly during these uh, crisis times it becomes even more apparent so for example let me give you a real life example where let's say we were selling uh, you know uh, express shipments to to uh, express services to companies where everything shut down this was back in april and the government put a complete ban on transportation so you can move anything so your transportation company but you can't move so what are you going to do you're zero ground zero no no uh, revenues no nothing so when you decide to move from that to b2b and start supplying pharmaceutical supplies to hospitals which the government allowed but now you have to go and find new clients that had to that had the need to move medicines from one corner of india to bombay or delhi how do you find these guys how do you set up your supply chain how do you set up the technology behind it so that it tracks it moves it bills it and collects that came with the innovation and the uh, automation and that was done in a matter of days so all hands on deck that's what i can say my core message to use everybody from a customer service agent to a courier to the ceo of the company all hands on deck and all hands focused only on two or three primary things that's it don't worry about anything else just get make sure that you get your clients you got your technology behind it and you got the operations read realigned to move those products and get into the new business thank you sir we have one question from dr vandana sonwani director of symbiosis institute of operations management her question is how does a strategist aim for goals 10 years hence forth especially when a company as of a status is, is weak what is the foundation of such plan i i missed your uh, earlier part of the question can you repeat it again please sure sure sir the question is how does a strategist aim for goals 10 years hence forth specifically especially when a company's as of status is weak what is the foundation of such plans very good question actually my presentation was almost talking about that and then i changed it to the the you know, kind of the messaging that we have to do today is actually how do you plan for a five year strategic business plan uh considering what's going on today uh i'm going to go back to my first reference to these uh trying times as a blimp in the history of your business 
if you start to think this is it and this is all I can deal with and it overshadows you, then you're lost already. So if you think, particularly as the leadership of the company with, of course, HR supplying that leadership, if you think that this is just a, a black mark and it's going to move on and next year and the year after business as usual, then this is not how your planning should be. So your plans are really based on number one thing, your vision. What do you want your company to be, right? That has nothing to do with COVID. So you want to place your plans on my vision of my company will be, I will be the largest logistics service provider in this country. That's my vision, right? That's delivery. So I'm going to do this. Now, once you plan that, what is your trajectory from where you are today to where you're going to go and how long it's going to take you? That's where you get your teams together and start planning. You don't think today there are walls falling down and the ceiling is cracking and all that. No, you just sit in a room and you plan on how you're going to get to being the best that you can be or the vision that you have. So you stay focused on that. Um, that will give you what you need to get there. For example, it might tell you that, you know what, to do that, you've got to come up with, I don't know, $5 million right now. And you've got to come up with $3 million down the road. It's all about resources. So you start to plan on how you're going to get there with the resources, with the productivity you need, with the sales revenues that need to be up at a certain point so that you can actually finance these changes and grow. But the main topic or the main point being keep your aim and your line of sight on that vision. If you do that and you work backwards with your engineers and your sales guys and your finance guys, they will give you the, the mini steps that you need to get to that point. And so you start to have, you build a team that starts to execute those mini steps every quarter. And you measure that until every year you're saying, yep, I'm on my path. Thank you, sir. We have one more question from Ratna Polri, Associate Professor, Symbiose Institute of Operations Management. Her question is, according to you, what is the shelf life of the changed HR strategies in response to the COVID? Shelf life of HR strategies in response to COVID? Yes. yes. Extremely short. Because again, I'm telling you, COVID is here to stay for a short period of time in the history of my company, your company, or our lifetime. So anything we do right now is a, almost like a knee-jerk reaction. It, with the lack of detailed information about this, this pandemic and with not knowing whether the vaccine will work, it will not work, you cannot have a long-term reaction to this. So everything is more like, for the moment, you're working from home, it seems to be working, you're, you're you know, making sure that your operations people wearing masks, sanitizing their hands, you know, all that stuff. This is all temporary. It's great to have it right now, but I don't see how restaurants, movie theaters, travel agencies, airlines will continue with one third occupancy in their setup. So Boeing is gonna go broke, and then Airbus is gonna follow, which means now you can't even travel to from Delhi to Bombay within a certain amount of time because now you're back on trains. So I don't see this thing as a really long-term issue. So any HR thing that you're doing right now, don't get too crazy about it. It's very temporary. Just go with the times. Just make sure that, like I think Ratan Tata said it in one of his uh, blogs, is this year is all about just surviving. If you survived this year, congratulate yourself. Don't worry about you know making profits and making growth and all that. Just make sure that you and your employees survived. That's all you have to do, just for this year. Thank you, sir. Thank you all for your questions.
we will now go back to the social launch for 10 minutes where you can network with each other Interning at Hindustan Petroleum Corporation Limited was a great learning experience for me. Pursuing an MBA in operation and the fantastic work culture at HPCL helped me learn a lot about the intricacies of the oil and gas industry and its daily operations. I had a lot on my plate to look forward to. A few of the many skills that I learned there were people management skills, interpersonal skills and I got a different perspective towards problem solving. It gave me the room to explore new ideas and be creative. SIOM has given me with the just right platform to help me grow as an individual during the course of my project and then finally grab a full-time employment with my dream company, Novartis. Coming from an IT background at SIOM, I got a perfect platform to leverage my IT skills in the field of operations and supply chain management. I did my summer internship at Bosch Limited where I worked on the latest happenings in supply chain space such as logistic optimization and supply chain 4.0. The enriching experience in Bosch helped me in diversifying my profile. At SIM, I got a perfect blend of industry related curriculum along with people management skills. This institute not only helped me in owning my management skills, but also gave me a perfect platform to nurture my creativity. SIM provided me with an opportunity to do my summer internship at Swiggy, one of the fastest growing food tech companies in India. Interning with Swiggy helped me to understand the operations of e-commerce hyperlocal market and apply my knowledge and skills to solve real-life business problems. The experience played an important role in making me understand the working of businesses at strategic, tactical and operational level. My work, dedication and learnings at Siom helped me back the PPO at Swiggy. Before getting into a management school, I have had my doubts with respect to opportunities for freshers. But SIOM cleared the smoke for me. It provides equal platform for both freshers and laterals. The focused curriculum of SIOM, the classroom discussions, the peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing opportunities and the case study competitions helped me build a strong base in operations management and rise to my aspiration. This rewarded my rigor with an internship offer at General Electric. My time at General Electric gave me the experience of leadership and application of theories of Lean and Six Sigma to practical problems to find solutions. With such experiences, SIOM served as a change agent for my holistic development. Coming from R&D background, I was always sure that I want to work with an organization that can give me operational learning in an enriching culture. SIOM provided me the platform to learn from different industry experts through guest lectures, seminars and trainings. The curriculum at SIOM helped me to understand the concepts, strengthen my basics and shape my skills to be well suited for an esteemed organization, Godridge and Boys. Siom was the perfect choice for me after working for two years in power industry. The best part here is that the curriculum is highly diverse, industry relevant, and along with academic knowledge, it ensures multidimensional growth of an individual. I realized this during my internship with GE, and my project there helped me showcase the abilities that I have during the final, final placements where I got through one of the most sought after consulting companies, Deloitte USI. One of the key reasons to leave a fulfilling career and pursue an MBA in operations management is to truly understand how different cogs collaborate together in companies to create competitive advantages, especially at scale. The exposure that SOM has offered me to concepts through case studies, classroom discussions and competitions has been phenomenal. SOM also gave me the opportunity to pursue a semester abroad program in Leeds Beckett University, United Kingdom, which helped me augment my thought process by learning in an interactional setup. During my time in UK, I was able to truly appreciate the strong foundation that SOM instills in its students, which enabled me to gain an edge over my peers across the world. Having worked in a construction industry, operations management was a perfect fit as a post-graduation and SIM proved a worthwhile choice. Apart from the mandatory subjects like Operations Management Lean, Six Sigma, SIM has laid a very strong foundations of financial management, human resource management and marketing management. 
I got to understand the whole gamut of supply chain ranging from operations planning, scheduling and control to supply chain modeling and analytics. I got a chance to intern with a leading FMCG company where I worked over the risk assessment of raw materials. The learnings from there helped me to understand and answering the questions that I faced during my interview of the company of my dream that is KPMG. Working in new product development wing of a global consumer durable company, I realized that an efficient supply chain and operation strategy forms the backbone of every successful organization. The academic curriculum at CIOM further broadened my horizons on the same and not only strengthened my subject knowledge but also made me industry expert. The attending guest lectures from prominent industry experts gave me a fresh perspective on the current industry trends and peer learning from a diverse batch molded me enormously as an individual. My overall experience at CIOM helped me bag my dream offer at one of the finest FMCG companies of India, ITC Limited. I had my prior work experience in the field of aerospace and that's why I acquired the knack of understanding the supply chain. And clearly SIOM was the best shot at it as it is one of its kind of institute offering a dedicated program in operations management. Uh, post joining SIOM, a uh, couple of months into the program, I got into General Mills as a part of my summer internship as a supply chain analyst. A lot of things that are taught here in the form of live case studies, simulations and an industry ready curriculum has helped me to cruise through my summer internship program at General Mills and eventually I've got a free placement offer from it. Even after being a fresher, SIOM has given me immense opportunities to work as a team leader and a team player at various events. Apart from the theoretical knowledge, I got the opportunity to do various live projects at leading manufacturing firms that gave me hands-on experience on practical implementation of what we study here. Later on, I joined Reliance Geo Infocom Limited as an operations intern wherein I got insights on back-end operations of a telecom firm. With all these experiential learnings and practical knowledge that I have gained from various fields, I evolved as an operations professional and a great individual that has helped me to grab a full-time employment as a supply chain management consultant at Dow Centric. I joined Siom with over three years of experience in IT operations. Siom's excellence in operations management helped me enhance my technical skills as well as managerial abilities, transforming me into a leader. These two years helped me in realizing my career goal by giving me Great. Um, good evening, everyone. So lovely speaking to all of you. I think uh, the theme is about culture. So what I will try and uh, do is maybe tell you a bunch of stories that will help you understand what culture is all about. I think stories are a very, very powerful way of uh, communicating very important lessons. So I'll use that medium. I think that's very powerful. And with the younger generation of students, I think that really works. So you know, all of you are... Sorry, sir, to interrupt you. Before we move on, I would like to give a small introduction about you. Oh, sorry. I didn't know that. I thought you wanted me to go away. Ah, not please. a problem. Not a problem. Okay, sir. So go ahead. Welcome back to the eighth episode of Digital HR Summit 2020. I hope the networking break was engaging and value adding. Before we move on to the next keynote speech of the day, I would like to thank our event sponsor for their generous support. Our outreach partner, Dare to Compete. Our magazine partner, Human Capital. A home deco partner, the Maharaj, our official gifting partner, the Soul Store, our digital platform partner, Airmeet, our knowledge partner, NovaX, our event listing partner, NovaFest, our corporate gifting partner, the Good Road. Keeping up the energy and learnings from the previous session, we will now move on to the second keynote speech of the day. Let me introduce to your to you our next keynote speaker, Mr. Hari Tian, head HR of Big Basket. Mr. Hari and I am Kolkata and IIT Madras alumnus with almost 32 years of experience in several roles such as HR, engineering and product management. He is the author of and publisher of the book Saying No to Jugaad, The Making of Big Basket and is an active advisor and mentor to numerous budding entrepreneurs and startups. Mr. Hari is extremely passionate about solving problems and building organizations for scale, uncluttered thinking and relentless execution. Without further delay, I invite Sir to share his thoughts on importance of authentic workplace cultures, the only truly sustainable competitive advantage. The session consists of 20 minutes of keynote speech followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. 
Meanwhile, I encourage the delegates to post their questions in the question tab. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Sachi. So, as I said, you know, the topic is very interesting and this is about culture, creating a sustainable competitive advantage through authentic culture. And culture is something that can be communicated best in the form of stories. So I will use this medium of storytelling to be able to communicate some interesting life lessons. So all of you are familiar, you know, with the life in the savannas in Africa. You all of you must have seen some of these discovery and, uh, you know, channels, uh, plan, animal planet and other channels. You must have seen a zebra or an antelope or an elephant um, or a gazelle giving birth to a little baby. And within 30 seconds, the baby is up on its feet and running along with the herd pretty much at the same pace. So very quickly on its feet and very quickly independent. Just compare that with a human baby. It almost takes 10 years for a human baby, you know, to be reasonably independent. One would say it might be a little longer or it might be a little shorter, but it takes a pretty long time. So in some ways, evolution has taken a big risk with the human species, which is by putting the baby at risk for 10 years. So obviously, there must be some huge benefit arising out of this risk that is being taken and the investment that is being made. We just think about it. What is the investment that's being made? Investment that's being made in the first 10 years is entirely about culture. It is a baby understanding in the first 10 years how to you know, effectively get along in society, understand signals, understand unspoken messages, understand sarcasm, understand humor, understand how to get along with aggressive people, understand how to collaborate, understand how to influence in different conditions. So all this is nothing but culture. So I think culture is deeply ingrained into all of us right from the day we are born. And we keep on learning, you know, in the first 10 years and subsequently as well. So huge investment in culture has already been made by evolution in the human race. Today is Teacher's Day and the birthday of, you know, Dr. S. Radhakrishnan. So he had tried to define culture and civilization very, very crisply. He had said, you know what? Civilization is what you have and culture is what you are. Very, very apt, I would say. You know, also there is a you know quote by Drucker, which is about you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. I think all of you must have heard this. But the interesting thing is that, you know, all of you students and I was a student at some point of time, you know, we learn about operations, we learn about, you know, strategy, we learn about finance, we learn about accounting, valuations, we learn marketing, digital marketing, we learn a hundred things, but we really don't get to know what is culture. And interestingly, even after you join an organization, People's understanding of these different domains that I talked about, operations or, you know, strategy or marketing, keeps improving with time, keeps getting refined, honed, and they become much better in these domains 20 years down the road as they compared to what they were at the beginning of their careers. But unfortunately, when it comes to culture, their knowledge 20 years down the road is just as good or as bad as it was when they started their career. So you can actually ask, you know, take an exercise, ask five senior executives in a company, take them to five different rooms and give them a piece of paper and ask them, you know, can you explain to me in very simple terms what organization culture means to you? Question number one. Question number two is, in your organization, what do you think are the salient aspects of culture that define your organization? You are unlikely to get very consistent answers across these five individuals. That itself shows, you know what, that on a topic as important as this, there is not a very deep understanding uh, in organizations. IBM, you know, had done extensive research and had found out that a very significant part, you know, of an organization's performance is determined by culture. A significant part of a team's performance is also determined by the culture in the team. So, for example, it said that the leader of a team influences the culture in the team to the extent of 70%. And the culture in a team influences or swings business results to the extent of 30%. So, culture is not some mumbo-jumbo stuff that HR people talk about. It is something very real. I think uh, even young founders have begun to understand this in startups. They've really begun to understand this because unless you work in organizations, unless you experience it, and in a fast-paced culture, especially in the startup culture, startup environment, the effects of culture begin to play out in a very short time frame. And therefore, you can visually experience it. 
So let me just uh, explain to you a little bit about different aspects of culture. So culture can be understood as at three levels. The first level I would say is artifact level. If you walk into an office, what is the dress code that you see? What is the office decor that you see? These are all artifacts, but don't get misled. They don't represent culture at all. They don't represent an openness just because you don't have doors or you don't have cabins or everybody is sitting in the open does not mean it's open culture. So these are all artifacts. The policies that the company has are artifacts. The second level at which culture manifests itself is the espoused values. A company can say, you know what, that we are very customer centric. We are, we have a maniacal focus on customers. Speed and, you know, agility is important for us. But their espoused values, their statements of intent, they don't indicate culture either. Because a company can say we are very, very customer centric, but do everything which is not customer centric. They might say speed and agility is important for us. Employees are important for us, but they may not do anything that is in line with what they're saying. And therefore, the real culture is what, you know, people in a culture, in a company actually do. And therefore, what do they demonstrate? The kind of behaviors that they demonstrate every day. People don't listen to what leaders in a company say. People listen to what leaders do in a company. So if you demonstrate customer centricity, then people will understand that customer centricity is important. If you demonstrate speed and agility in your actions, people will understand the speed and agility is important at a company level. So culture is what is done. Culture is a set of rewards, is a set of behaviors that are recognized and rewarded by the company consistently. So for example, if a particular behavior is rewarded, that becomes the culture of the company, irrespective of what you say. So for example, if you publish a policy which says, we do not tolerate any kind of harassment or any kind of sexual harassment. And if your top salesman who brings in 30% of the revenue is accused of sexual harassment and you backtrack on this or you soft pedal on this, don't take action. Then the company is telling, communicating the message that the sexual harassment prevention policy means nothing to us. Therefore, a policy statement does not mean anything. It is the kind of, you know, actions that the companies take on deviant behaviors it is a kind of behaviors that are rewarded, recognized that really defines culture. So I think you need to get it because many people mistake some of these visible indicators of culture, the artifacts for culture itself. And they really have zero relationship or zero you know, linkage with the culture of a company. It's the way the company has chosen to present itself. It's the way the dress code is the way the employee has chosen to present herself or himself. So that really is the basics of culture. Culture is important to know that it's very difficult to build. And once built, it's very difficult to again change it. Why is it difficult to build? It's difficult to build because it takes time. And why does it take time? Because it's not just publishing a set of policies. It's about living a set of values month after month, day after day, year after year. So it takes a long time. And therefore, building a culture is not an easy process. It takes time. It takes, you know, continuous effort on your part. So for example, if you believe humility is important for you as a company, then the founders and senior leadership have to live humility every day. And it takes time, you know, for those messages to percolate down and for the entire organization to begin to demonstrate that value. And that's pretty much the reason why, you know, when people say, how do we change our culture? That's a funny question because you can't change your culture very easily. It takes a long time to build and it's almost impossible to change. And that's the reason why, you know, you have so many of these change management programs. Change management programs are really culture change programs. And therefore, most change management programs fail because they involve changing the fundamental culture of the company. And that's not very easy to accomplish. I'll just tell you a few real stories and then maybe you'll understand this better. We just have still, we have 10 minutes more. And what I'll do quickly is uh, I will tell you a couple of stories and uh, through stories, illustrate some of what I said. But I think before I do that, I think it's important to understand this. So what I'll use is I'll use game theory in two minutes to explain why culture is what it is. Let's assume that you are working for a company and you are working in the marketing function. So you have a day job to do. And the company decides that there is a very important cross-functional project, company-wide cross-functional project that needs to be undertaken for which they pick you and pick six other individuals to work on this cross-functional project. Six individuals from six different teams. You are the seventh person. Now you have to make a choice whether to work hard on this cross-functional project or focus on your day job, get your KRAs done, 
you know be successful in your day job keep your boss happy make your boss look good or should you you know compromise a little bit on that and spend a lot of time on the project now all the other six individuals also have the same choice which is they can work hard on the project or they can take a free ride now let's just see two by two very powerful you can look at this on the x axis the choices you have are work hard on the project take a free ride on the y axis seven six other people have work hard or take a free ride now let's assume you work hard and everybody else takes a free ride the project is bound to fail and uh, you're not going to get rewarded for being part of a failed project team and your day job also has suffered so you suffer on that count as well and your boss is going to tell you what a fool you have been you know you worked hard on this cross functional project your day job suffered i look bad you look bad our function goals were not met instead if you take a free ride and everybody else you know also takes a free ride then the project fails but at least your day job has gotten done so just think about this a little carefully since we don't have the time if you think about this carefully you will realize that the default choice that any rational person will make is to take a free ride because that gets you the best of both worlds most of the time and therefore the reason why you know you can use this game theory to explain a lot of things like explain this you can explain why traffic in bangalore and mumbai is so bad but in places like singapore and boston you know even when there's no traffic cop in the middle of the night traffic comes to a halt when you know signal turns from green to red now let's just change the example a little bit so let's assume in the same example in this cross functional project you work hard on the project everybody else takes a free ride the project fails but your boss and the company leadership tell you that you have been an amazing corporate citizen you have demonstrated true com- company you know loyalty and you are the kind of person we would want to promote into leadership roles we don't want any free riders in this company if that is the stand the company takes then you will automatically work hard the default choice for a rational person is to contribute to the cross functional project so what has changed from the previous situation to the situation is the way leadership has behaved in the first situation leadership was upset that you worked hard on the project and didn't do a good job on your day job whereas in the second case people looked at you as a great corporate citizen because you sacrificed a bit on your day job but tried hard to make a cross functional project succeed so that's you know helps you understand what is really pr- culture and how you can use it how you how it really affects through this game theory i'll just go to some quick stories now i'll tell you the stories of you know digital equipment corporation it was a cool you know iconic silicon valley company in the 70s and even in the early 80s and it was a company started by ken olson and ken olson was you know a bright uh, computer science engineer who believed that you know we need to design product for the bright guys for the brilliant users not for the dumb users and he figured out that if you have to build product for brilliant and bright users you need to recruit brilliant people who can come up with these products and when you recruit brilliant people smart people you need to give them the freedom to take decisions freedom to do what they think is right you cannot create a hierarchy you cannot override their decisions because smart people like to be independent so he created a culture of independence where people could decide what is right or wrong in terms of product they didn't have to take consent from anybody and for there were four engineering teams in the company deck went on to build some amazing products many people used the deck products and deck was a very loved and respected company but at some point of time ibm also figured out that you know they need to come up with a product and they came up with the ibm pc which they designed for the dumb user they felt that the dumb user market was much bigger than the smart user market and riding on the microsoft operating system the ibm pc was a runaway success it was a huge success and you know what digital had to try and respond to that and when they tried and res- to respond to that they couldn't reach an agreement on what product to launch to compete with the ibm pc each of those four engineering managers came up with their own different product with their bells and whistles and they figured out you know what let the market decide which is a better product even the ceo ken olson you know didn't have the casting vote he couldn't decide which of those four to launch or how to design the product that would fight with ibm pc as a result of which you know all the four products that deck launched were a failure they bombed at the marketplace deck as a company was dead after that the lesson in culture here is that deck was very successful in an era or in a situation where they had dis- agreed to build products for 
smart users and they had created a culture that could generate these products the culture was recruiting smart people and giving them a lot of autonomy independence whereas ibm built a commodity which was you know a low cost commoditized product which required very hierarchical thinking discipline which required you know optimization of costs all of that were far more important than being extremely creative so you know the two and where the situations were different so deck could not adjust in the second situation the point i'm trying to make is that culture is almost impossible to change culture is like for a company it is like what a personality is for an individual each of us is an individual you know some of us are amazing at wooing new people selling some of us are good at problem solving some of us are good at analytics all of that but each of us is good at what we are we are if i am great at analytics i might not be able to go and sell you know if i am a great particle physicist i might not be a great marketing person so each of us has a personality which is very difficult to change we can try and make some adjustments and try to fix some gaps in our personality but we can never be entirely different individuals so when circumstances change some of us will struggle to adjust it's the same thing holds true with companies as well the companies are personalities they can make some slight changes in culture but when they need to you know replace their culture wholesale because the circumstances have changed many of them often die so that's the reality i think uh, we are almost running short of time but uh, i'll just just give you maybe one or two small examples as well you have seen you know uber you have seen uh, we work and you have seen what happened to both these companies you know uh, travis kalanick was the ceo at uber adam newman was the ceo at uh, you know we work and you all heard of uh, the you know, toxic culture that was existent in both these companies it required a susan fowler to write about the toxic culture in uber it was all hidden it was all behind you know closed doors kind of uh, but once uh, susan fowler wrote about it once we work had some troubles and people began speaking about it everyone began to realize that these companies had very toxic cultures which actually came to hold them back so while there is no good or bad culture because personalities are also not good or bad each of us is who we are but when it comes to culture toxic cultures are definitely bad but you could have different types of cultures which are equally good one quick example i used to work for this company called daksh which was a startup which eventually went on to be acquired by ibm and as part of ibm and part as part of you know concentrix it went on to become a unicorn and uh, big basket which is currently already unicorn they are two completely different cultures but both were extremely successful so you can have success coming to you you know in two different ways and you know big basket the cu- culture is one of i'll quickly explain this to you we are a low margin business grocery is a low margin business therefore the business imperative is to be able to adjust everything to this low margin looking at cost the kind of people that we hire everything and therefore the kind of people that we hire are those who can punch above their weight class we don't look for great communication skills because they add to the price point we look for people who can execute well who can think reasonably clearly in the regions we don't even want people to think clearly we can get people in corporate functions to think clearly draw up processes and equip the regions with amazing processes so that average people can deliver outstanding results and that's the way we have built a very frugal culture including the kind of people that we hire and not all of them for example can think very independently many of them need to be told how to do things so a lot of senior leaders at big basket play the role of teachers teacher leaders as teachers because the kind of people that we have are not completely autonomous or independent in terms of thinking and acting whereas if you go back to daksh daksh was a very high margin business and we felt that to be able to scale we need to hire competent people who can run on their own who can build businesses on their own they don't need to be told what to do so we went and hired people from the best b schools the best you know minds people who work for great companies terrific track records who could execute well think well communicate well came at high price points but we built a company that could grow rapidly where individuals could take decisions didn't depend upon corporate functions for guidance at every step whereas at big basket the regions tend to depend upon the corporate functions for every step the corporate functions have got some amazing people but the regions have got people who can execute well the price points of people that we hire is much lower we are very thoughtful about the way we do it as compared to this big basket is a place where people are soft spoken if you don't perform well you could get another chance you could get another chance you don't get fired for non performance 
at Ducks, you would easily get fired for non continuous non performance. You didn't get many chances. Very aggressive place. This is a very soft spoken place. So, two different cultures, both amazing companies. It's like saying, you know, two different individuals. Albert Einstein was very successful. Mukesh Ambani also is very successful. Very different personalities. But each in their own fields, they build their own, you know, you know, success stories. So I think, you know, culture is very similar. You can build your own success stories depending on who you are as an individual. And when it comes to startup, it's really about founders. What, who is a founder? What does the founder stand for? What are the deep beliefs of a founder? Where does the founder come from? So I think that determines to a large extent the culture of a company. And founders could come from different backgrounds, different experiences. They must have seen different contexts. And each of them leads to different beliefs about how to do things, how to succeed. And therefore, cultures in different companies are different. But it's important to be aware of this, important to be able to percolate it down, important to create alignment in the leadership team so that you could all pull together. Culture is like Adam Smith's invisible hand of the free market. In economics, that's the a mark, free market is acts like the invisible hand that keeps everything together. In the organization, culture is that invisible hand which keeps everything together. And with that, I think I have reached my 20 minutes. You're on mute. Sanchi, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for such an insightful session. My key takeaway was uh, culture, the real culture can be defined as consistent demonstration and behavior of the people in the organization. We shall now move on to the Q&A session. I request the delegates to please raise their hand to ask questions while I take few questions from the question staff. We have one question from Dr. Vandana Swanambane, Director, Symbiosis Institute of Operations Management. Her question is, people move from organizations to organizations. Do organization SLS, culture, fitment during selection process? How? What guidance will you give to MBA? Very good question. Frankly, you know what? Um, culture fit is often misunderstood. Uh, for example, you know, as I told you, culture manifests itself at three levels. The artifact level is the least representative of culture. But the terrible thing is that most recruiters or most hiring managers look for culture fit at a artifact level, which is the wrong thing to do. So, for example, if there is a marketing team in a company and the marketing team at the end of every review at night, you know, after the review is over, at eight o'clock goes out to a pub and has beer and does a beer bash. That is an artifact of the culture. It does not represent the true culture. So if you reject a candidate because the candidate is not open to some of these beer bashes because she has a family to go back to in the evening, that's a very wrong assessment. That's got nothing to do with culture. So culture fit should be looked at a more fundamental level. It should not be looked at a match at the artifact level. I think that's the way companies should see it. Many companies end up making that mistake. Smart companies understand that, you know, you need diversity when it comes to these artifacts, when it comes to, you know, dress codes, when it comes to whether you want to, you know, party in the evening at night or you want to stay home. These are all choices that should be given to employees. They've got nothing to do with culture. Culture is about, are you a team player? Do you collaborate well? Do you credit give credit to people when it is due or do you seek credit for yourself? When something goes wrong, do you say I was responsible and if something goes right, do you say my team did this? So that is the real culture. So you should look for these values and the deeper manifestation of culture rather than the artifacts. Thank you, sir, for the answer. We have one question from Joel John. His question is, many times the company culture is only established in the corporate head office. If you go to the branch offices in different regions, the company the company culture is different. What are your say on this? Who is this? Who has asked this question? Interesting. Uh, Mr. Joel John. Okay, this is a very interesting question because uh, this can't be asked by somebody who does not have any work experience, clearly. So I, in some ways, I think uh, culture tends to be manifested a little more at the head office, if you will. But I think companies must make the effort to ensure that culture percolates down to the different offices in the country and outside the country. I think that's very important. There are many ways in which you can see the culture in different parts of the organization. That's a very important you know, aspect of seeding culture. One of the you know, good ways of seeding a culture 
for example, if you're moving to an office in Costa Rica, if you're opening up an office, try and move. The, you can get the first person to head that office to be a culture ambassador of your company, somebody who stands up for the culture and the company who represents the company's culture truly to head that office for a period of six months during the time when the hiring is done, initial hiring is done. Leadership can spend more time in Costa Rica, you know, in the first one year uh, it is very important to do that. So I think if you make that effort and if you ensure that there is constant interaction, there are several mechanisms by which regions that you talk to, you know, remote offices interact with corporate office functions. And they can be in the form of reviews, they can be in the form of visits, they can be in the form of knowledge exchange sessions. So I think you must make the best of all these to ensure that it's not just your corporate office, but every single remote location must reflect at least the core components of your values and culture. Sure, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. We have a question from Mr. Akshat Mahatu. His question is, we always knew culture was defined by behaviors. What's new in the What's new is the intentionality that is critical to the managed behaviors. We don't, we don't really manage a culture. Instead, you manage the behaviors that shape it. How did Big, ba Big Basket went forward with this? So it's correct. What uh, you said was correct, which is that demonstrate the behaviors, right kind of behaviors. And that really is culture and it will take root. You know, one way in which every human being learns and that's the way a child learns is imitate, improvise, which is you see how somebody you look up to is doing something, you imitate that over a period of time, you improvise on that and then it becomes a habit. And you see 10 people in the company, leadership team in the company doing something in a particular way. Others also begin to do that in a particular way. So, for example, if you believe that those who supply services to you or products to you, your vendors, you should treat them with respect. You should ensure that they're paid on time. If the top 10 people in the company demonstrate this regularly, if they ask this question in reviews, then everyone in the company realizes that we can't take vendors for granted. We need to treat them like our customers. We need to pay them on time. We need to treat them with respect. So I think it's always this. You need to figure out what matters for your business, what behaviors are important, and then live that every day personally as well as through review mechanisms, ensure that everybody else also does that. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the answer. Next question is from Dr. Vandana Sonwane, Director of SIOM. Her question is, can organizations evaluate level of cultural attainment? If yes, how? I'm not really sure about uh, this. I think there are several tools, you know. Hofstadter's tool, there are very, several uh, standard tools that uh, you can get employees in an organization to fill in. And uh, by seeing the responses to these survey responses, I think some experts can uh, take a view on what the culture in your company is. So I think that broadly is it, but I have never been a fan of such a rigorous approach to understanding culture. I think uh, the way I have seen culture is that identify what are the three or four things that really matter for your organization and live that every day. For example, at Big Basket, we figured out that you know, in terms of values, we said, you know what, respect for people is important. And we said humility is important. We thought about this very carefully. Humility is not every company's value, but at Big Basket, it's a value for us. Humility right from the top to the bottom. And we said transparency is important as well. And we said when it comes to elements of culture, you know, what we decided was we created four culture elements. I'll just give you an example of what percolated down to the roots in the company and what did not percolate. So, for example, maniacal focus on customers is an important culture for element for us. And top to bottom, everybody demonstrates this. And you know why it percolated down? It percolated down because the management team, the top 10 to 12 people in the company live this every day. Now, this other culture element is speed and agility in everything that we do. That element has not percolated down at all because the top 10 to 12 people do not live that value every day. So sometimes you can call out a culture element, which is an aspiration. And if you don't live that every day, then others don't live that. So it doesn't become your DNA. So speed and agility is not a big basket DNA, but maniacal focus on customers, you know, personal accountability and responsibility for everything that you do, taking ownership for 
things that are not completely in your control those are completely el- are elements of culture but speed and agility because the senior most people don't necessarily live that it has not percolated so its culture is all about those behaviors which you really care about thank you sir for the answer the next question is from sanit kumar the question is in this new normal situation how can the culture of the company be pre- percolated in the employees even when they are working remotely that's a good question it's a tough question as well i think uh, working remotely has changed a few things it has uh, made people behave in odd ways especially leaders i think uh, leaders who are secure so for example let's just take uh, in a physical workplace situation what happens for example if i am a manager i walk across to all the people in my team and figure out what's happening i ask them you know what's happening on the darwin box implementation what's happened in this policy what happened in that so just by you know talking i get updates you know in a minute i get to know everything that's happening now sitting at home how do i get those updates now the question i need to ask myself is why do i need those updates so i think secure leaders take a position that everything i knew in the past i don't necessarily have to know now the one of the reasons why i have updated myself in the past was maybe because my bosses used to ask me some questions and i had to be ready with those what's wrong with you telling your boss i am not aware of this if you want something more about this i'll find out and let you know so i think if you take that position then you will start empowering your team a little more you would trust them a little more and life could be far easier for yourself and for your team whereas if you are the other type of a person which is that now how do i take updates and i start getting worried so i trouble people i schedule 20 reviews i call up 100 people and waste the time then it put stress on me put stress on my team as well so i think uh, remote working has separated the wheat from the chaff when it comes to leaders people who are secure people who know how to empower people who know how to trust versus those who struggle with being insecure struggle with trusting struggle with competence i think uh, this has highlighted the and brought out those differences thank you sir for the answer There's one more question from Dr. Vandana Solwane, Director of SIOM. A question is with respect to Peter Tucker's statement that culture eats strategy for breakfast. How do organizations maintain a strong correlation with success of strategy? I'm not sure I fully understood that question. All I can say is that you know strategy is about making those uh, you know very important decisions or choices which can benefit a company in the long term but ultimately how you execute on those choices will be determined to a large extent by the kind of culture you built so uh, you know strategy is really about two things making strategic choices and executing strategically in fact in my book you know pony to unicorn i have defined a nine parameter framework for companies to be able to scale and i said making the key strategic choices getting them right is very important so for example big baskets decision to go in for an inventory led model or an asset heavy model as opposed to a hyper local model was a very important strategic choice softbank told us it won't work tiger global told us that that it won't work but we were very very sure that this is the only way to do it so we made the choice many, many others who went the hyper local way died and one or two have quickly pivoted to the inventory led model so i think making the strategic choices is about strategy execution is about culture a large part of execution is really about how teams come together how they collaborate with what speed do you execute what metrics you measure your orientation towards customers your orientation towards external paying customers as well as internal customers what kind of culture have you built in dealing with internal customers ownership the extent of ownership that you take all that goes into execution so that's the interplay between strategy and you know culture culture is about execution strategy is about strategic choices you are on mute thank you sir thank you sir for the answer in the interest of time we'll take one last question the question is from amit lamba how company gets to know that the way of working cultural needs to get changed even if the profit margins are at play are are at place right so um, 
as i said you know don't have to always think about changing the culture of a company right we never think about changing personality how often in our life do we sit back and say can i be like shahrukh khan i wish i were like you know mukesh ambani i wish i were like narayan murthy we don't think of that often right we just think about you know what is it that i could have done better why did i make that mistake next time what should i be doing how should i de- how should i be defining the problem statement better that's the way you deal with your life you don't really begin to think of how do you change your personality and that's true for companies as well companies don't sit and quickly start thinking of you know how do we change our culture that's not a question that occupies companies minds at all they're running the business the business as you said is running very profitably and therefore the company needs to really figure out whether broadly are things okay or not sometimes you know the company has mechanisms to pick up those red flags sometimes the 360 feedback you know mechanism can throw up you know the inform the data that one member in the executive team is something very fundamentally wrong nobody seems to like him customers don't seem to like him employees team members don't seem so you always have these mechanisms to spot some of these red flags and you take actions on these red flags rather than thinking you know is there something wrong with the culture of the company those are the questions that you don't really think and this you know there's something fundamentally you think of you know culture when you acquire another company you think how do we integrate well together how do we work well together those are times when you seriously sit back and think about culture but otherwise you don't have to think every day thank you sir thank you sir for the answer thank you all for your questions this entire episode was full of learnings based on knowledge and expertise there were numerous takeaways and the spirit of thing let me now call upon mr vibhav singh convener hr summit 2020 to give a vote of thanks Good afternoon, everyone. Like all good things come to an end, we are now concluding our eighth episode of HR Summit 2020. The best thing about today's keynote addresses is that they are coming from leaders who are part of organizations which are building a new India, and we as professionals look at these institutions as someone who challenged the status quo and created a vision for new trends in part by technology. Thank you, Mr. Sirajiv Dutta from Delivery, who joined us from London. Thank you, Mr. Hari from BigBasket.com. Your insights were extremely important in shaping the minds of the young professionals. I would like to thank our esteemed delegates for their active participation throughout the summit. Thank you, Dr. Vanna Sunmani, Director of SIUM, and Dr. Yashwamundra Khadde, Faculty Convener at HR Summit 2020 and Placement Head at SIUM, for their constant support throughout. Thank you, our esteemed and respected faculty members and SIM staff members, to make this possible. A heartfelt applaud to our sponsors and the student organizing team of HR Summit 2020 to be the backbone of this event. With this, we are now concluding our eighth episode and look forward to your participation in the last and final episode tomorrow. The social lounge feature is available for the next 15 to 20 minutes. Wish you all a very happy next day. Thank you once again. Have a nice day. Good afternoon.